Jeez, you guys, you all want to learn about .NET stuff. How many, uh, just out of curiosity, how many .NET developers in the room? Good. How many C Sharp? Any VB? Any F Sharp? Any Boo? Um, Nemerly? So you're all C Sharp developers. All right, fair enough. Oh, wait, C++ CLI. No, okay. You're all C-sharp developers. That's fine. I can work with that. Um, in this particular presentation, basically, I want to go over the uh, common intermediate language, which is the .NET bytecode set. Um, <clears throat> specifically, I want to show you some of the tools that you can use to examine CIL. Um, I want to, and CIL, by the way, is synonymous with IL. IL, intermediate language, was the name that Microsoft used before they actually wrote the specifications that we'll talk about a little bit later. It was later renamed to be CIL because technically Java is also an intermediate language. There are several different intermediate languages which are available out there, and Microsoft wanted to uh, try to steer away from uh, trying to make use of a more standard term for something that was uh, very specific, that is to say the intermediate language for the common language runtime, or what we would later call the common language infrastructure, which is the spec, uh, I'll get to all that later. The whole point is there's this layer underneath the code that you write, and it serves a number of useful purposes to understand what that intermediate language looks like, how to actually do what we'll call round tripping, how to take the code that you write in C-sharp, turn it into IL, and then turn that back into compiled code. So that can be useful in a number of ways, uh, some of which I'll talk about a little bit more explicitly. But for the most part, the main reason you really want to know this is because it's always instructive and useful to understand one level lower than the layer at which you write. So if you write C sharp code, it's helpful to understand IL and CIL because in many cases, you'll be able to understand what the compiler is doing much more effectively. And this will, in some cases, settle certain arguments as to whether doing a thing one way or another is more efficient, generates more bytecode, et cetera. I've watched developers argue for hours on end, weeks on end, over whether or not it's better to use string concatenation or to make some other method call when in fact they could really have settled the argument in about 10 or 15 minutes by writing some code, decompiling it using some of these tools and looking at the generated IL and then be able to make a more informed decision. So it's always useful to know one level below the level at which you are at. All right, first thing I wanna do, how many people here Recognize this. Okay, trick question, just checking to see if everybody's awake because if you don't know how to do hello world in C-sharp, you probably want to go to one of the Java sessions down the way. Um, not to say that Java is simpler or anything, of course, but if we do the builds, of course, what we're going to end up with is hello world.exe. So if I flip over to my command prompt here, hello world, right? There's my bin directory, right? There's debug, yay. That's the one and only demo of the entire, no, I'm teasing. All right, so when we look at hello world.exe, right? Notice 4.6K in size, right? Now, one of the things that happened here and we know this because if you've sat through any introductory .NET cores, you've heard this over and over and over again, that the compiler turned this into an assembly, and the assembly was then uh, either it's a .exe or it's a .dll, but the assembly, in the case that it's an exe, actually has a bit of code at the very beginning that knows how to bootstrap the CLR, et cetera, et cetera. Fundamentally, what's in there is a tiny bit of x86 to bootstrap this whole thing, and the rest of it is all IL bytecode. Now, by the way, if we talk about doing this on .NET Core, if we're talking about doing this on the Mac, the only difference in the assemblies, very bluntly, is that on the Mac, there's a bootloader, a shim that you have to run explicitly. When you say .NET, you say .NET Run or something, there's a specific launcher application that's used to bootstrap the CLR as opposed to here on Windows, we can rely on some sleight of hand at the Windows operating system level to bootstrap the CLR. 
Either way, the rest of this thing is all intermediate language. It's all the assembly format. Now, if I want to look at the IL that was used to generate this, I can make use of a tool that shipped from the very, very earliest days of .NET. This used to be available as a standalone download in what they called the .NET Framework SDK. Then they sort of rolled it in as a part of Visual Studio, and today it's basically just one of the checkboxes that you include when you install VS. As far as I know, it's not available as a standalone uh, install anymore, but I could be wrong because Microsoft, they change their opinions pretty much like other people change underwear. So it may still be there, I'm not sure. IL DASM stands for the IL Disassembler. Oops. And specifically what this tool does is it takes compiled assemblies and turns it back into raw IL for us to examine and work with. Now, by default, IL DASM, when you give it an assembly file, it pops up this GUI. And my apologies already for the font sizes, but unfortunately this thing was written back in like 2001, back in the day when we all only had one font size. Okay, guys, that's a joke. Still no laughter. I'm going to work at making you guys laugh until we're all very tired. That's the best I'm going to get. All right, fine. Be that way. No, seriously, the IL DASM tool was written back in, uh, actually, I think it was written in 2000, back during the early uh, alphas and betas of the .NET SDK, and it literally has not been touched since. So when I talk about changing the fonts, I can, but it doesn't persist it, so it's kind of pointless. What we look at when we see here is the fact that hello world.exe is an assembly, and you can tell that because there is a manifest here that specifically has a number of interesting bits of information. Some of this we'll talk about more later, but specifically we can see in here some of the assembly title attribute, assembly description attribute, assembly configuration, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of these annotations are what are present when we look inside of the Visual Studio project when we look at, for example, let's see, here we go, assembly info.cs, assembly title, assembly description, assembly configuration, et cetera, okay? This is, we are looking at the compiled representation of these annotations, these assembly level annotations. They get specially treated by the compiler and get put into the assembly manifest. That's actually a standard, standard part of compiling these assembly level annotations, okay? So all of that is basically to show you that yes, in fact, when we are looking, whoops, when we are looking at this disassembly code, we do in fact see that there is a namespace. That's what that little red and blue shield is. That's the namespace, which corresponds to the namespace hello world. And then we see hello world. This blue icon here represents a class. And here we see class program. And then we see main, and sure enough, there is a method main here. Now notice that ILDASM reveals already something that many of you, most of you probably already knew intellectually, which is to say that the c -sharp compiler will synthesize a constructor for you if you don't have one present. Because notice in my c -sharp code, I don't have a constructor for the class program. But when we look at the decompiled code, there is definitely a constructor there. And by the way, this is just the structure of, you're saying, well, yeah, but I was promised that there would be actual bytecode that I can look at. It says it right there in the abstract of your talk. Sure, if we double click on the constructor here, we can see IL bytecode. And I'll walk through what each of those things means as we go through the rest of this presentation. But in this particular case, all it's doing is literally calling directly up to the base class constructor, which in this case, by definition, since any class we extend, if we don't explicitly say that we extend something else, we implicitly extend system.object. So we are implicitly calling the system.object constructor and then doing nothing with the result because there is no result in returning. This is bytecode, okay? Now, <clears throat> One of the other things I can do with ILDASM, besides that graphical representation, that's useful if I just want to you know, sniff around and kind of see what's being generated. The other thing I can do with ILDASM is it actually has the ability to emit all of this to a file. So if I specify out equals, 
I can tell it to decompile into a text file of some form. So let me say out equals to hello world.il. Oops, helps if I spell it correctly. IL dam is not a tool. There we go. And sure enough, there is a hello world.il. And just to prove that there is still, in fact, a place in the world for Notepad. OK, but Notepad needs to be a little bit bigger. How about we make you 16 point? There we go. This is what the complete assembly decompiled looks like. Okay. Now, in of itself, this is interesting. But the most important part of all of this, and notice we're getting a lot of word wrap here, but the most important part of all of this is I can take this, this decompiled, this deconstructed IL text file, and I, actually, I can actually round trip it back into an executable. So let me do this. I'm going to copy hello world.il, and I'm going to put it a couple of directories back. Okay, so we're right here at the root of the solution file. IL ASM is the IL assembler. It does the opposite of what IL DASM does. It takes your, your IL assembly language code and turns it into a compiled executable. So if I do IL ASM hello world.il, we can see it did some assembling, generated, emitted a class, emitted fields and methods, etc., wrote the portable executable file format, operation completed successfully, hello world.exe, hello world. And just to prove, right, no sleight of hand, nothing up my sleeves, let's go back to note, whoops, helps if I spell it correctly again, notepad, hello world.il, and let's see, instead of saying hello world, what I actually want to say is hello Riga, okay? IL ASM, hello world.il, it all wrote out correctly, run it, hello Riga. You, you are all easily impressed. But, <laughs> not really, he says. No, really, really easily impressed. Thing of it is, this proves the point that we can actually do the complete round trip between IL, go take your C-sharp code, decompile into IL, and then round trip it back into a compiled assembly. That can be important in a number of cases. Although much of the world is in fact moving towards more of an open source model, inevitably there are gonna be projects, libraries, commercial tools in fact, that you will acquire that you don't have the source code to. And it is entirely possible that you will find a bug in one of those libraries that you can fix if only you had access to the source. Well, by definition, you have access to the source. As a matter of fact, you have access to the real source. This whole C-sharp thing, that's basically a tool for weak programmers who cannot program in IL directly. Yeah, fight me. This is the original language of the .NET platform. And interestingly enough, there are some aspects of IL that are not directly emitted as a part of C-sharp. There are a few things that IL is capable of doing that C-sharp is not, at least not yet. Now, the interesting thing about that is there are other languages that in fact compile to IL by code. And there are some language constructs, for example, in VB, the with keyword, that C-sharp doesn't have. And so part of the thing that you can reasonably ask yourself is, well, if I, if I wanted to actually build a language that could be used from you know, my colleagues, C-sharp, uh, could I actually build assemblies? Yeah, you do it in a couple of ways. There are some libraries inside of the CLR itself, such as reflection.emit, which will let you emit the bytecode through a sort of reverse reflection rather than using system.reflection to discover what fields and methods there are. You can create a class, you can define the fields, you can define the methods, emit that either to an in-memory assembly because you don't expect this to survive this particular program run, or you can actually emit that to disk and save that down the road. And there are a number of tools over the years that have actually made use of that functionality. As a matter of fact, ASP.NET did this for a while. They called it phantom assemblies, if I remember correctly.
So this is actually not an unreasonable trick, particularly if the alternative is I'm going to use reflection to directly invoke stuff as opposed to let me emit an assembly that compiles against the, the, the target code that I want to reflect against. That can yield a performance benefit of somewhere between 10x and 100x over using reflection directly. So there's definitely good things that you can use, uh, good things you can do once you understand that IL is just this really straightforward format. Okay, so IL DASM, that's the disassembler, right? It round trips with the IL assembler. Uh, IL DASM, the assembly will bring up the GUI view. IL DASM out will give you the text output view, usually because you just want to use that directly towards round tripping. IL ASM, both of these, by the way, will be accessible on the, the, uh, the Visual Studio developer's prompt, right? So let's see, which one is it? I've got too many of these. There we go. So when you install Visual Studio, they will put the link developer command prompt. It will automatically have the path set up correctly. So you should be able to pick up ILASM and ILDASM. If for some reason your installation doesn't have it, go back to your Visual Studio install and look for the checkbox that says .NET, SD, .NET Framework SDK. Similar tools are available for Mono. If you're one of those who uses Mono on Linux or Mac or something, or if you're doing Mono on Windows, I'm not sure why you would do Mono on Windows, but in case you're one of those brave, foolhardy souls, Mono has ILASM and ILDASM because those are tools that are actually mentioned as a part of the specification that governs everything that is .NET. All right. And then to ILASM, you can, you can either explicitly uh, do a slash exe or slash DL, DLL. The executable is the default. That's the assumption. If specifically you want to make it a library, do slash DLL. And if you want to include debug information, slash debug, you're, off, you're on your way. Again, this is what hello looks like. And we'll walk through each of those keywords in a little bit as we go through all of this stuff. Part of the thing you need to understand is all of this is written down. All of this is not something that Microsoft created and hold on to the secrets of. All of this is formally documented in what's called the CLI specification. So if I pop up Chrome here and assuming that the web holds up, ECMA CL, uh, common language infrastructure specification. Back in the earliest days of .NET, they decided that they actually wanted this to be something that was uh, supported by a variety of different companies. Microsoft realistically wanted to take the opposite tack that Sun and Java took. Remember, when Sun was looking to standardize Java, they first went to the various standards organizations. They approached ISO, they approached ANSI, they approached a number of these different groups, they approached ECMA as well, and said, will you standardize Java? And all of these groups said, yeah, we'd be more than happy to standardize Java, but here's what standardization means. You guys will have to be uh, present at committee meetings. There will be votes. There will be discussion. There will be you know, uh, potential debate as to whether or not certain features would be added. And at that time, Sun said, no, 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 no. You don't understand. When we said standardize, we meant you take what we give you and you make it a standard. And all of the standards bodies basically said, no, you don't really understand how standards work. Other people get to have a say. And at the time, Sun thought that would really inhibit their innovation. So they said, screw that, we'll create our own standards. And that's how the Java community process came to be. Make no mistake about it, the JCP is only as much of a standard as Sun and now Oracle want it to be. It is entirely a proprietary international standard, if you want to think about it that way. Microsoft said, we'd really like to see other people do interesting things on our platform. So we're actually going to take the hit required to develop all of this specification documentation. And it is a hefty amount of documentation. All of the runtime, what we would refer to as the common language runtime, that is actually an implementation of the common language infrastructure, the CLI. And that is governed by six different documents, all of which are available for download from ECMA, okay? Now, they are arranged specifically into what they call partitions, partition one, concepts and architecture, metadata definitions and semantics. Partition three is the reference for all of the CIL instructions. 
So if this is something that you're going to take and potentially research once you walk out of this room, partition three in particular is going to be what you're going to want to have handy as you start looking at all of this byte code and trying to figure out what each instruction does. Partition one will be very useful because it is sort of the overall description. It talks about the notion of what they call the virtual execution system, the VES, what we would otherwise refer to as the virtual machine. It talks about the stack, which I'll get to in a little bit. It talks about the, no the notion of verification and all of that stuff. It is the prose that describes what the CLI will do, where partition three is the reference. Now, all six are interesting in their own right, but from a bytecode perspective, really partition one and partition three are the ones where you wanna get started, okay? And like I said, three is just a reference. There's not a lot of descriptive prose. So if you're really curious to, to understand how things work, you wanna read partition one. And it looks like they've put all of this together into either one PDF or a zip file. Uh, one of these is also an XML spec that describes all of the different parts that are considered standard to the common language infrastructure. Interestingly enough, in the seeds of this lie the .NET Core Foundation. The whole split between .NET Standard, .NET Core, Windows.NET, uh, Mono, et cetera. All of that lies, this is basically at the heart of that, and then they piled a few more things on top of that. So if you're curious about .NET Core, if you're curious about the differences between .NET Core, .NET Standard, and the, the .NET framework, which is the Windows implementation, again, these are good places to go, okay? All of that is basically to say, this is all described somewhere. There's reference material. So if for whatever reason you uh, get back later and say, hey, I, uh, I don't remember anything of what he said, that's fine. It's all out there for you to pick up, okay? Notice that the sixth edition was updated in 2012. This is prior to when Microsoft did all of their open source work. What Microsoft has basically discovered is Nobody else cared. They put in a metric crap ton of work into these specifications. And HP and Intel and a bunch of other companies were actually a part of these committees. But as the initial fervor around .NET, um, you know, okay, .NET is out, .NET 2.0, .NET 3.0. And by the time we got to .NET 4.0, a lot of these companies, their initial interest had kind of waned. Part of that had to do with the fact that Microsoft themselves weren't quite sure what to do. They weren't open source, but they had these documents. There was a tremendous amount of work required to uh, uh, update these documents. And so a lot of the effort around doing that standardization kind of fell by the wayside. And in some respects feels a little unnecessary since Microsoft has since decided to open source everything. I don't agree with that decision. I think actually it's more important for them to have these documents up to date as they move down the open source path, but they haven't asked me yet. So the point is that a lot of this stuff, uh, the actual runtime, the actual common language infrastructure has not seen a great deal of change since .NET 2.0. Most of the changes that Microsoft has made would be underneath the levels of these specifications, improving the garbage collector, improving the JIT compiler, none of which is actually specified in here. They say that there's going to be one, but they don't stipulate any sort of behavior there. So a lot of this is still very, very, very applicable. Um, some of the changes that Microsoft is talking about in C-sharp 7 and 7.1, 7.2, et cetera, some of the reference for example, the introduction of the tuple type, it probably should be brought out in this, but that's just a new class that's not really changing anything at the runtime level. Now, one of the things that you want to understand if you're going to be in this space is the CLI spec was driven by a number of core principles, and these are described in the spec, but I've just called them out here. Number one, they want to expose all of this using a unified type system. Well, that's kind of a given because if I can write something in C-sharp and you can access it from VB or F-sharp or Boo or Nemerly or any of these other languages that compile to the CLR, we all have to have agreement on what that means. This is what the common type system, the CTS, is designed to provide. Anything that is capable of creating a new type in the whole CLI world is known as a CLI producer. And if you can consume that type, you are a CLI consumer. And most languages, of course, are both. 
Not always, but but uh, matter of fact, at the very earliest days, Microsoft's JScript implementation, which was their one of their very early cuts of JavaScript on the CLR, it was simply a consumer. It didn't actually create new types. It just knew how to use the ones that were available. All of that is described here, including how we package them up and how we load them up in such a way that everybody agrees, for example, on how big a 32-bit int should be. Specifically, is it signed or is it unsigned? And do we agree that this is a 32-bit value as opposed to a 64 or 16, et cetera? All of that needs to be laid out so that everybody can understand that we're talking the same types. Resolve dependencies between types. If I have a class that inherits from another class, what's the order in which they get loaded? What are the actual dependencies that are being expressed here? If I have class hello world that uses system.console, well, what is the, the type of console? And let's make sure that that type gets loaded before I actually use console. Or let's agree that at the time I want to use console, I'll go load that type at that moment. All of that has to be laid out and described. Perform processor-specific tasks, such as layout and compilation. Am I running on top of an x86? Am I running on top of an ARM? Am I running on top of some other hardware platform? One of the things that the CLI decided very early on is that they did not want to make any of these decisions ahead of time. That was the danger that C++ fell into, which meant that when you were compiling code, you had to know the processor architecture of the machine that was going to run this at some point down the road. And what most of us did, those of you who never actually programmed in C++, you missed out because most of what we did is we sort of guessed and then we threw a whole bunch of optimization switches on the grounds that our guess was correct. And in some cases we were right. And in many cases we were wrong and performance suffered. Why should I have to guess? At runtime, I can actually look beneath me at the CPU, figure out what it is and do optimizations based on the CPU at the time I'm running. That was a whole large part of the reason for JIT compilation as far as Microsoft was concerned. Execute code under the control of a privileged execution engine, meaning somebody is watching out for you to make sure that you can't screw things up, like if you try to walk off the end of array. We're familiar with that. Design runtime services to be driven by extensible metadata formats. Metadata, that's specifically the data that describes your code. Technically, it shouldn't be called metadata. It should be called data about code. But that's kind of tongue trippy, and it's just faster to say metadata. When you use some of these annotations over here in the uh, assemblyinfo.cs, this is all metadata. This is all information about the code. We will never execute any one of these annotations. As a matter of fact, you'll never execute an annotation ever. The annotations are what allow you to provide custom extensible metadata. And in some cases, that data will be consumed by the compiler and in some cases, that will be just simply dropped into the assembly for other tools to make use of at a later point. But the whole point here is I can create another one of these custom attribute types anytime I want. And I can make use of it. As a matter of fact, we see a number of libraries out there that create their own annotation types. They're preserved inside of the assembly and they're used at runtime. Case, case in point, HTTP get HTTP post as a part of ASP.NET MVC. That is all information that ASP.NET resolves at runtime when it slurps your assembly in. So a lot of this is stuff that the, uh, the CLI specification authors designed from the get-go. And bytecode makes use of all of these things or participates in these things because in many respects to describe the type, we have to have a standard format for doing so and that's what we use the bytecode for. So more around the CLI spec and the CTS and so forth, which I won't get into because they're interesting, but they're not specific to bytecode per se, and I want to get into more of the syntax, but they are important to be able to understand these terms when you start reading through the documentation later as you research this stuff. So a lot of this is for you to peruse if you grab the slides later. Now, when I have this, when I have this little bit of IL. Earlier we did class hello world, right? In this case, I called it class app. There's a bunch of descriptors that appear before the name app. 
The first one is dot class. There will be a number of keywords in IL that we will see that are prefixed by a dot. They're keywords for IL. They are basically an indication that we are beginning the description of a thing. Dot class indicates that we are creating some sort of new type. Interestingly enough, whether we're talking about a class, whether we're talking about an enum, whether we're talking about an interface, at the IL level, they are all considered a class. This is important because the notion of an interface is actually one that is particular to C Sharp. Now, that notion is one that has bled over into a bunch of other languages because it would be kind of hard to use .NET if you couldn't consume interfaces or define new interfaces in some cases. But from an IL perspective, an interface is just a class with no method implementations, the end. There's nothing particular about it. There's no reason to have a new keyword for it. So dot class here simply indicates we're creating a new type. Private is pretty self-explanatory. This is your access specifier. It says that it is private to this assembly. Nobody else outside of this assembly can see this class. That's the typical default whenever you write something in C Sharp and you leave off any access specifier in front of the class keyword. Auto and ANSI are new, to you at least. The bytecode here specifically has some rules regarding, for example, how we want to do layout of fields inside of this class. Normally what will happen is the runtime will actually engage in some hijinks, some shenanigans, in order to get some optimization out of this. If you have, for example, if I come back here to my code, keep forgetting to hit the wrong key. If I come back here to my program.cs and I want to create a class person like so, and let's say I have, I'm just going to do these as public fields for the moment, public int age and public um, byte um, IQ. And if I have public short uh, height, oops, like so. Now, in earlier languages, it seems kind of strange to imagine this, but in earlier languages like C++, these fields would need to be laid out in exactly that order because that was the way they were defined in the class. Because back in the old days when we did C++, I didn't know the field name age. I only knew that that field was zero bytes offset from the beginning of the object. And I didn't know that there was a field called IQ. I only knew that there was a field that was four bytes offset from the start of the object. Oh, and by the way, the first one is four bytes long, and the second one is one byte long, and the third one is two bytes long, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in some cases, on some processors, it actually makes more sense to try to align all of these things on what we call word boundaries. So if I'm on a 32-bit processor, it's faster if these fields actually line up specifically on 32-bit uh, boundaries. Now what that'll mean is three fields here times 32 bits each, ooh, there's some waste there. That byte, for example, would be wasting the three additional bytes in that 32-bit word. And if I'm on a 64-bit processor, it gets even worse. So do I choose to try to lay these out in a more compact fashion? These were all things that we had to think about back in the days of the C++ world. Most of the time, the virtual machine is going to do the right thing. But there are going to be certain cases where we specifically, usually for interop purposes, we want to make sure these fields line up in a precise way and only occupy as much space as they're supposed to, and everything gets smashed together, and who cares about those word boundaries? If you're doing interop with a lot of old C++ code, this becomes really critical. The other question is, how am I representing strings? How am I representing the character data? Whoops, other way. How am I representing the character data? That's basically what the auto and ANSI keywords are describing. This is auto laid out, and we are using the ANSI character set. Before fielded it, this basically suggests that before fields are initialized, this class wants to be, wants to have the opportunity to initialize things to zero. Okay. Most of the time, the c -sharp compiler will always emit before field init because it wants to potentially do some shenanigans with your fields even before the constructors fire. We see the class name app, and then we see extends bracket ms corelib system.object. The bracket is referencing the actual assembly that this type comes from. That's the formal name of each of your types that live inside of the CLR. Bracket assembly bracket, and then the fully namespace qualified name. 
Okay. One of the things about CIL is that if you're familiar at all with any uh, assembly language, one of the things you know is that CPUs typically have a number of registers. The Intel chip actually has fewer registers than most. Most of your 32 and 64-bit chips, like the ARM architecture, they will actually have 32 or 64 or more, in some cases, registers. And so uh, an assembly language can actually put a bunch of values into each of these registers and suck them out later. The Intel architecture has like five. They have five registers of varying sizes depending upon whether this is a 8, 16, 32, or 64-bit chip. And one of the things that becomes really tricky if you're writing code for an assembly language on the x86 is when do I use a register and when do I not? Well, again, all of this is virtual as far as we are concerned. The CLR is not an actual CPU. It's an abstract representation of one in many respects. So what the CLR decides is there are no registers. If the JIT compiler wants to make use of a register at runtime, that is totally its choice. But as far as the CLR is concerned, there are no registers. There is only what we call an execution stack. And the execution stack is arranged into slots. Java actually made the mistake because Java made the same decision. Everything is stack based in the JVM as well. Java made the mistake of specifying that the execution stack is 32 bits in width, which made sense in a time when we had 32-bit CPUs. The only problem there was Java also spe specified that we could have 64-bit longs. So now every time I want to make use of a long parameter, I have to occupy two slots on that stack. Microsoft looked at that decision and said, that's stupid. We are not going to specify the width of a particular slot. That is an implementation detail. But there is this execution stack, and I push stuff onto that stack, and then other places can pop stuff off of that stack, and that's, in fact, how we will communicate from one method to another. We will actually, when I get ready to call something, for example, if I go back and do ILDASM, actually, let me just bring up the IL here. Like so. Remember when I get ready to make that call, the console.writeline, line, there is one parameter, the string that I wish to pass to that right line method call. So what that means is I have to, at the calling side, I have to push the string onto the stack. Well, to be more precise, because the string could be any, any size, right? This could be one byte in size. This could be 100,000 bytes in size, right? Strings can be unlimited in size, theoretically speaking. What I really push is I push the reference to the string onto that execution stack, okay? And we can see that happening right here because specifically I use this load string instruction to load the constant string hello Riga and push that onto the stack. Now, at this point, console, well, OK, am I invoking an instance method? Because if I am, I need an instance on which to invoke it. I need a this, basically. But console has nothing but static methods on it. So console.writeline is a static method. So I don't need a this. So my stack is perfectly set up. So now I can simply call over to writeline and it will consume, it will pop that first parameter off the stack, and lo and behold, everybody will be happy. Getting a slightly more complicated example, let's do this. Hello, Riga. It is system.datetime.now. Dot two string. Let's do that. Okay, if I build this, and then I need to go into hello world bin debug. Well, first of all, let's run it, make sure it worked. Okay, cool. It is now 4.40 in the morning because I live in Seattle. Okay, let's bring this guy up. Notice that there's my person class, class private auto ANSI before field in it, et cetera. Here's my main, okay? 
Now, first of all, notice load string, that pushes that onto the stack. Notice then I call value type system.daytime, system.daytime.get underscore now. You'll discover that there are no such things as properties at the bytecode level. There are only methods that you didn't have to write. So every time you do a get off of a property, it's under the hood invoking get underscore property name. And every time you want to set something, it's invoking set underscore property name. We'll talk about some of that in a second as well. But notice that what we do is we call that method here. And then notice we use this instruction here, stloc.0. In addition to the execution stack that we use to pass parameters, there's also a local for a local variables stack. So technically there's two stacks in question. Now what I do is I take this object that was returned to me, and by the way, this object that was returned to me was pushed on the stack by system.datetime.now. It took that datetime object that it created, pushed that onto the stack and returned. So the stack has now gotten to be two slots deep Remember, the first one is holding my original Hello Riga. Second one holds that date time. Now, I want to take that date time object and I'm going to use it in further code somewhere inside of this thing. So I want to pop that off the stack and put it into the local variables array at slot zero. Then I'm actually going to load that same instance and I'm going to invoke two string on it, which will create a string, push that onto the stack. And now if you notice, the stack is in exactly the right place I need it to be. It's got the date time object, it's got the hello Riga on it. And so I can just call console.writeline. This time I'm invoking the one that takes two parameters. It will consume both of those off the stack. Write line has no return, so there's no object returned to me on the stack. Therefore the stack begins at zero, ends at zero, we're all happy, the end, okay? Oops. All that we work with is done using this stack passing metaphor. Globals, slightly different because they are simply hanging off as fields somewhere inside of an existing class. If you work with a language that actually supports global variables, usually what happening is the language creates a global class singleton and all the globals then become fields off of that global singleton class. So you basically are accessing static fields. Everything is done using this stack. And as you've noticed looking at the code, everything is fully namespace qualified, assembly and namespace qualified. There's no shorthands inside of IL because we need to be as explicit as possible. You're familiar with all of the data types, of course, from C-sharp. Most of those are mirrored inside of the bytecode itself. So notice that we have void bool, char and string. Again, basically those are Unicode. 32 and 64-bit floating point values. Notice, however, that the IL level, we don't actually go for names like float and double. We just basically say name and then a size. So we don't have short, we have int 16. We don't have long, we have int 64. Part of this means that it's easier at a later point for the IL guys to be able to add additional sizes. So if at some point the IL, the, the, the ECMA specification decided that we want to support a 128-bit primitive type, then we just call it int 128. Now what C Sharp wants to call it, that's up to the C Sharp designers. What VB wants to call it, that's up to the VB designers, okay? But as far as the IL is concerned, they are basically signed and unsigned 8, 16, 32, and 64-bit ints. There is also a native int. There are times when we need to work with something that is precisely the same native width. This is typically when we work with pointers. Yes, the CLR knows how to consume pointers. If you've ever written unsafe C-sharp code, that's exactly what you're emitting. But there are a number of cases where the CLR itself will actually make use of these native pointers, even if you're not doing unsafe code. Delegates are a perfect example. So we need to have a type that represents a native integral size, whatever this particular CPU is. 
on a 64-bit CPU, a native int would be 64 bits in width. Whether this is signed or unsigned depends on whether the unsigned appears. Object is a standard object reference, and then they actually have managed pointers, unmanaged pointers, and method pointers. Lots of things that the C-sharp specification sort of hides away from those of you writing C-sharp code. Now you've seen some of these directives already. Dot assembly indicates that we are declaring an assembly. This is typically what shows up in the manifest file. We are creating hello world, uh, the assembly name, whether it's a dot exe or a dot DLL, assemblies don't care. So the name of this assembly is hello world, period, end of, end of story. If I reference another assembly, well, then it becomes an assembly extern directive, indicating that I depend on not only that other assembly, but also its version number. So for example, if we look at the hello world bytecode again uh, here in the manifest, notice that up here at the top, we are declaring that this assembly extern MS Corelib. We depend on the MS Corelib assembly. Not surprising, everybody depends on that assembly. That's where we get a lot of our core basic types. But notice that we are specifically saying that we depend on version 4.0 of MS Corelib. Okay? This is how the Microsoft guys tried to avoid some of the DLL hell version mismatching that plagued Windows in the years prior to .NET. Then we see the .assembly directive. Here we see all of those custom values. But down here, of course, at the bottom, we have .ver 1.0.0.0. This is what the assembly version attribute does inside of your own code, okay? There's a couple other directives here. There's the module directive, which indicates that this assembly is made up of the module hello world.exe. There was a time when we thought that it would be good to be able to have assemblies that are made up of more than one module. And it took us all of about six months to figure out that was a bad idea. But if you go back to the very early .NET 1.0, uh, documentation. They've got a lot of that stuff listed there. We see stack reserve. How much space do we want to save on the stack? Subsystem is a flag indicating that this is a Windows console user interface, et cetera, et cetera. Most of these flags are here as um, basically performance enhancements. They're tips for the CLR to understand. They're not actually critical to understanding IL. The dot entry point directive, which I didn't show you, the dot entry point directive will be around main. This indicates where the entry point for the application actually begins. There is no reason why your application entry point has to be main. That is a convention that C Sharp installed. Max stack, how deep does the stack go for this particular method? When the C Sharp compiler compiles your methods, it actually does some analysis to figure out how deep the stack needs to be at most. And that way, the CLR can reserve exactly that much space off of the CPU stack in order to make sure that it's not taking up more room than necessary. Dot locals will actually declare if there are any local variables. And usually, they go by really, really intuitive names like v underscore 0 and v underscore 1. And you can guess what the next one is. Exactly. It's very, very, very cryptic names. Why the v? I still haven't figured that one out. Okay, abstract, sealed, nested, uh, before field init, we've talked about a lot of these, okay? So we've seen this. Fields, if we look at the person class, which I won't bring up right this second, it'll look very similar to this. If I have here another app, it's got two fields. One, of a, one is of type message and the other is a static object array called cached values. And again, notice dot field private simply indicates that it's private as opposed to public or some of the other access specifiers. You've seen already dot ctor. That's the special name for a constructor. Dot ctor is the special name for a type constructor. If you've ever written a uh, if you've ever written a static initializer method for C sharp, you have actually written a method that is called dot ctor. This is part of the reason why the C-sharp language does not allow us to use dots in the actual names of our classes or fields or methods because the underlying runtime wants to use those dots to indicate special names. Now, one of the things I do want to bring up, uh, let's see, let me do this real quick. So let me come in here and let me create a public uh, override string to string, right? 
And let me, let's go ahead and leave this implementation in place. Let me build it. And actually, it's actually, the build is going to crap out. And I'll tell you why. It's because I have ILDASM open. It locks the executable so that I can't overwrite it when I do a new build. If you do this, if you, if you spelunk around with ILDASM long enough, you'll run into that same error. And it will drive you batty trying to figure out why the compile failed. So if we look at person here, we can see age, height, IQ. There's the constructor. There's the two-string method. Notice that it says public hide by sig virtual. Hide by signature virtual meaning I am overriding a base class method. This is so that the compiler can verify. But let me do one other thing here real quick because, of course, we all know that public fields are terrible. What we would prefer is properties, right? Properties better than fields because Anders said so. Notice now what's going to happen with my person type is a couple of things have added. First of all, that field, bracket age bracket k underscore underscore backing field. That's what happens every time you use one of those auto-generated properties. The C-sharp compiler synthesizes a name for you, and it synthesizes a name that you could never actually write by using the brackets, which are, by the way, perfectly acceptable names inside of the IL specification. The other thing that it does, though, notice down here, this orange triangle, age, is a tiny bit of metadata that indicates that there is a property called age and that the get property, notice it's marked as instance, so this has to be done on an instance of person, and the get property actually invokes the get age method, which we can see also got synthesized here, and the set age also got synthesized here is what's used every time you set a property. So technically speaking, would it be faster, more efficient, more optimal for you to go ahead and directly access the fields? Yes, but you would lose a certain amount of opportunity for encapsulation and you are selling short the ability of the JIT compiler to recognize that this rather simple property here, where I just basically load the standard field for that age backing field. Notice first thing I do is I load arg zero, that's this, push that onto the stack. Next, load the contents of that field and read it, okay? So this is literally just grabbing the value of the field and handing it back. The JIT compiler can actually inline this. If you look at the generated x86 inside of Visual Studio, if you go into the debugging view and look at the generated x86 code, what you'll discover, particularly if this property is referenced repeatedly, this probably gets hoist into a register, which is the fastest access possible. So despite the fact that the IO will tell you that these are properties, the JIT compiler also introduces a layer of indirection as well so that the bytecode will tell you one thing, but you really should look at the generated x86 if you want to get the absolute precise story, understanding that the JIT compiler will sometimes generate different things under different circumstances. All right. So this, for example, is an implementation of main and in this particular case, I'm referencing a couple of locals. You'll notice the no-ops here. Those are exactly what they sound. They do nothing. These will get eliminated as soon as the JIT compiler gets hold of this. If some of these locals are referenced frequently inside of this method, they'll get hoisted inside of registers, et cetera. But this is what your C-sharp code basically will turn into. And in this particular case, I'm doing a simple test. And let's see, I'm testing basically to see if one of these is less than zero br.s is basically a branching instruction telling me to go down to further inside of the main. Everything is stack-based. I mentioned the locals array and method parameters. So we have to have instructions for being able to manipulate the stack. Duplicate the top element, which basically is a pop and then two pushes. This is used a lot when we pass parameters around uh, from locals. Pop, load the local, put it onto the stack. Load an argument from the method call, put it onto the stack load a field, load a static field. All of these basically push things onto the stack, usually to be consumed by a method call later. LDC down here at the bottom, those are loading constants. And usually they are LDC dot I4, I, I8, R4, R8. 
indicating that I want to load a constant of a particular type. Branching and control flow, yes, we do have go-to. It's called jump, but it is effectively a go-to. I want to jump to a particular uh, uh, label in the instruction stream. Okay? That's usually used for those cases where I need to do some sort of unqualified break. So if you have an if or a for loop, a uh, for loop actually, not an if, and if I have a break or a continue, those are usually implemented using a jump. Switch is actually built into IL. You can do a table switch. We also have call and call I. The call instruction says I want to invoke a particular method. Call I says I want to invoke through a particular pointer. If you use delegates, if you use lambdas, generally those actually turn into call I instructions. One of the things that IL does is it understands the object system implicitly. So I can simply say new obj. So if I want to instruct, if I want to construct a new instance of that person, I can simply say new obj person colon colon dot ctor. In other assembly languages, I have to go through a lot of torturous lengths in terms of allocating the space first, then putting the constructor around that particular space. I'm looking at UC++. IL actually understands the object system, and so as a part of the generated x86, it'll do all of that. But from us, from our perspective, at the IL level, I can simply say new obj. Init object, there are a few rare cases where I want to initialize an object specifically over some pre-allocated space. Generally, that's not something you will do, but the runtime may need to do it. If I wanted to work with arrays, new, or, new R, meaning I want to create a new array of something, and then load element, store element to access the elements inside that array. Is inst and cast class, those are basically your instance of, and uh, is as and direct cast um, operators. And call vert says I want to invoke a virtual method. Exception handling is done using dot try to define the actual block of code. And then we have several things that can happen inside of that block. We can either catch it. We can handle the exception, but we don't want to exit. We can handle the exception if a filter succeeds. This is one of those features that C Sharp does not have. You can actually write a bit of code saying, test to see the exception is of this type. If true, drop into this catch handler. If not, keep going. I don't know why C Sharp doesn't expose that, but it does. Dot property I already mentioned. Dot event. Basically, if you write events inside of C Sharp, you're creating more of those metadata constructs. But again, you're basically working with methods uh, that are delegates, and we can add them to the delegate inv invocation list. Generics are a particularly odd case. If I actually create a generic instance of something here, so let's say I have public list person children, like so. Let me build this. Let me look at the corresponding ILDASM. What we'll notice is that the fact that this is a generic is actually stored here. Notice that we have this generic list, and notice that it specifically references hello world.person. When .NET was getting ready to do generics, one of the questions they had to ask themselves is, well, do we want to do the C++ style where we actually code gen out all of the possible ways this generic gets used, which is part of the reason why uh, templates in C++ led to such code bloat? Or do we want to do the Java style where we just pretend generics are there, and when we get to the runtime, everything actually turns into object references. .NET chose to take a middle route, where they actually capture the fact that this is a generic, a type parameter will be supplied at runtime, but then that type parameter is actually captured in the IL, so that when we reflect on this, we can see that children is not only a list, it is a list specifically of type person. This adds to better type safety in the language, as we go and use it for other languages. So VB knows that this is a list of person, and F Sharp knows that this is a list of person, and if they try to violate that type safety, that will generate a runtime error. In the Java world, if you have Java generics and you look at it from Groovy, it's not a list of person, it's just a list of object. And that's been one of my frustrations with the Java world for many years because of that. So this is what the generics will look like if we actually create a new generic type Notice that bracket T, and then that T becomes a placeholder for type, uh, type information throughout the rest of the IL. There are a number of preprocessor directives. They're not really worth going into other than to say that they're there. And there are ways that we can actually define an alias. This is purely inside of IL terms. The compilers don't do this. 
simply because they generally don't care if they're more verbose in the aisle that they generate. Now, this has been a whirlwind tour. I do not want to pretend like I have covered the entirety of IL, and I haven't covered a lot of the things that you might use IL for. One of the things, for example, that I would suggest you do is, is if we come back here and if you look at, for example, let me create a method here or a class here, and I will call it class speaker, and I will say public um, string talks yield return um, busy, or let's just say CIL yield return assemblies yield return um, C sharp, etc. Now, this is giving me an error saying the body of Cannot, re cannot be an iterator because string is not an iterator interface type. Oh, that's right. This needs to be an I enumerator of string. What exactly are we doing here? How many people have actually looked at yield return and used it in any meaningful way? Probably because you have no idea what's going on here. <laughs> How do they make this work? Because technically what's happening is the first time I call into this, it will return CIL. The second time I call into this, it will return assemblies. The third time I call into this, it will return C-sharp. How do they do that? Now that you know how to actually look at the bytecode, you can actually go in and look at that implementation. And for any new feature that the C-sharp team introduces, you can look and see at how much or how little code is required to support that. You can do this for link, you can do this for tuples, you can do this for any new feature that C-sharp introduces, including dynamic, which is its own really interesting ball of wax. I could tell you, but where's the fun in that? Go investigate for yourself, okay? Mic drop, I'm out. <laughs>